Hi, everyone. So uh, first of all, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, this talk is based on uh, stuff that I did when I was working at Perimeter X. I'm no longer working there, but I'm uh, showing you this with their permission. This talk is about the stuff that I find without looking for it. Some of us do vulnerability research. We pick a subject, something that's important, maybe cryptography. Uh, we saw the Omar's work on the Cisco routers, and we go looking for stuff. And sometimes we just do our stuff, and things show up. So I'm going to show you some examples. They're not super sophisticated. At the end, I'll tell you why. There's a reason why they're not super sophisticated. This is supposed to be entertaining. So just sit back and enjoy. Uh, we start with surveillance cameras. I live in a new building complex. We have three buildings, and uh, we have a WhatsApp group for the building. And one day, I get the message saying uh, they install security cameras. And if you want to watch the cameras, we have about 11 cameras for a building. So you uh, install uh, this uh, application, and you get uh, the credentials. You actually have four items in the credentials. You have the building name, you have uh, an IP and a, and a port, and you have a login and a password. So that's not trivial. Okay, Sh shouldn't be guessable, right? And uh, then it works. You add it on the application, and there you go. You get access to the cameras. You can watch it live. You can go and see archives and all that. And then I'm like, hmm, there's an IP address, and it says colon 22. Is that SSH? I don't know, but let's look. So I try with the, the obvious. What's the obvious? You try the web administration thing, OK? And uh, guess what? For some reason, it's enabled. This is the screen of one of the ADSL modems that they have in Israel. And the remote administration is actually open to the to the wireless access, uh, wireless network, uh, sorry, wide area network, which is something you just don't do without a very good reason. And uh, uh, you want to guess the password? It's admin admin. I get inside, and then I see that they have a wireless network and a bunch of uh, devices connected. And looking around a little bit more, I get to the uh, uh, IP and, and port forwarding menu. And that attracts my attention because it turns out that they have three different forwarding rules, and they're all named like the buildings, which is kind of interesting. So of course, the natural thing to do is to say, OK, if my building is the Geffen one, Geffen means vine in Hebrew. So if mine is the, the Geffen, and I'm using port 22, then you know, if I just change the device name and the port name, they're probably using the same credentials. And of course, they are using the same credentials. And before you know it, I have full access to all the cameras of all the project. Now, uh, here's the thing. This is still in research. It has just occurred to me that the company that installed the, comp the, the cameras might have done the same in other places as well. So I'm now working on scanning the entire IP address space of Israel looking for these devices. And any ADSL modem that has the remote administration enabled and has the same for IP, IP forwarding rules uh, is probably using the same system. And I'm not going to say the credentials, because you're all going to go and try that. but it's very simple, OK? So this is still in research. Uh, taxi order. So we all travel a lot. We actually uh, we call it the Security Vacation Club. I'm sure you've heard of it before. And uh, I go to the airport, I get, I get a cab. And uh, there's a very uh, famous vendor in Israel, and they have an online reservation system. You can just go in, and you reserve a taxi to go to the airport. And it's very, very convenient. You uh, get this dialog, you put in your phone number, and then your address. But the thing is, if you've made an order in the past, if you put in your phone number, they automatically retrieve your address. And there's no authentication of any sort. And uh, well, you know, what do you do? You, try to, you enumerate on phone numbers and try to, to get stuff, right? Uh, now, uh, in my research, I'm very much inspired by uh, Jeroen's work. Where is Jeroen? Raise your hand. He is one of my um, uh, mentors for ethical hacking. So this was done really in an ethical hacking. And just to show you, the biggest problem here is privacy, right? If I can translate a phone number to a location, to an address, then that's the privacy issue. So what we did, we retrieved the number. We converted it to a Google map uh, point. We threw away the information. And at the end of the process, we made a screenshot of the map, and we threw away the, the point data. So all we have left is this. There's no data. But this is interesting, because you can see the distribution of the people that use their taxi services. 
And it's interesting because they're all within the 67 lines. So I'm not making any statement, but this is just a nice observation. Um, so we wrote the disclosure document, and we sent it to them. But guess what? It's a taxi service. They don't know the first thing about vulnerabilities. So they didn't do anything. They didn't even answer us. We gave them a call. And it turns out that they don't actually run the service. It's a third party that does it. And when we looked further into the code, it turns out that it's the same service being used by 10 different taxi services across the country. So basically, what you can do is you just you can milk out the entire database. So we sent the, the disclosure. We reported it. And they ignored it. It is still working. If you want, if you, want you can do that, uh, which is kind of annoying. It's arguable whether this is a serious thing, because it's just a phone number, and you don't know who it belongs to. But I don't know. It's the stuff you see. This is a little bit more interesting. Uh, airport security. Uh, I was on my way back from another conference, and the world is a little bit different now. Who knows this guy? OK, this is Chris Roberts. That's the guy that got pulled off a plane because he tweeted something about taking over the engine. Now, he didn't really take over the engine. It was a joke. But the FBI and the Homeland Security, they have no sense of humor. And you know, better safe than sorry. And everything changed after, after him, because he's one of the best security researchers in the world. But he got in the public eye, right? So now we have a problem. You can no longer mess with uh, in-flight entertainment systems, which is really nice. I had some experience with that, but you cannot do that anymore. You can't fly with uh, certain hacking tools. That doesn't look well on the x-ray machine. And the TSA freaks out and other agencies. So all you can do is you know, stick with regular stuff, right? Now, what is regular stuff? I was flying back from uh, a certain country. Those of you who speak the language will recognize it. Right? OK, I'll say it's Poland. We have at least one Polish people here sitting front row. And uh, in the lounge, they have this little internet room. It's not a big room, maybe you know, four by four meters. And it has a bunch of all-in-one PCs, which you're free to use, and a wireless router. And once again, you, know, you see a wireless router. OK, <laughs> my flat is in 20 minutes. I have some time. Let's play around it. So what do you do? You open the computer. You get the router, access, uh, the router IP address, and you're like, OK. Let's try. Is it admin admin? And it's not admin admin. And I was surprised, because I was expecting it to be admin admin. But then something weird happened. I got distracted, and I didn't notice what I was doing. And instead of pressing tab, I pressed enter. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> boom. Now, I don't know what this is, but I can tell you this is not an ADSL modem. So uh, what is it? Let me tell you. <laughs> Terabit class convergence ready modular switch for edge to core and data center deployments. It has a greater than 9 point fine terabits per second. <laughs> so you see where this is going, right? And of course, advanced security platform. Uh, so yeah, you guessed it. This is the main switch of the entire airport. <laughs> and this is really bad. Yeah, that I'm not going to say which airport it is. Uh, so I start looking around, and this is where it gets really interesting. I have screenshots of everything, and then I get to the VLAN list. And let's go over a few of the VLANs. Now, mind you, I am on the internet computer that is open to the outside world, connected to the main switch of the airport using an admin pass uh, account with no password. Just saying. So administrators, interesting. Privileged, that's good. Secured servers, I don't really know what that is. And MGMP, MGMT, that's probably management, right? But that's not even the cool stuff. This is the cool stuff. Icelert, who knows Icelert? Icelert is a weather, yeah, please, that's dangerous stuff. Icelert is a weather reporting system, right? So when you see weather reports, that's how the airport gets that. That's nice. What is uh, FIDS? This. <laughs> Flat information data system. Right? You know what happens if you mess with that? I'll just give you the, the plain scenario. Let's say that I do a denial of service attack. Not even changing. Just, I don't know, make it crash. You realize that they immediately understand that something bad happened. They're going to shut down the airport. So this is really bad. 
but it even gets worse. What's BHS? Baggage handling system. You want somebody else's luggage? Or you just want to make sure you get your own? That's how you do it. And my favorite, CETA. CETA is the system that they use for all the reservations and all the customers. And this is all running through the same switch, which I'm now controlling. And I can open, I can add the computer that I'm on to any one of those VLANs and get you know, un unfettered access to the network. So lucky for them, I have a good friend that is uh, working at the CERT of Poland. I make a phone call right away. I'm sitting in front of the computer, and I'm calling him. And he's like, dude, I need more information. Thank you for reporting. I make a complete report with screenshot, and I send it to them. And then he called them. And you know what happened? They argued with him. They said, it's not possible. <laughs> so he read some IP addresses to them and some VLAN names, and uh, then they got convinced. So that thing, <laughs> so that, that thing got fixed, and this happened within two days. So this is a very important thing. And I'm telling you that because it's important to see how it requires no particular special skills to be able to create a huge amount of damage, right? And now we have two more examples. This one is not so much a vulnerability, but detecting somebody else's bad work, OK? Uh, some of you might have seen I've presented it in other places, so I'll go, I'll go quickly. Uh, I travel a lot. I'm single, so I use Tinder. And uh, this, we're going to see some, you know, Tinder is about meeting people and possibly having sex. So if you have a problem with sex, please leave. Um, you need to build a profile. You can read a lot about building a profile. You need a professional profile photo. We have that one. You need a photo with an animal to see that you're compassionate, <laughs> right? So I have that one. You need something of you doing sports or a hobby to show that you have a life outside of you know, work. And look at that. It's also an animal. So I got that two covered. Uh, you need something official or at work. This is me presenting at some other conference. And the last thing, you need something silly or creative to, sh to show that you're a fun person to be with. And that's me getting drunk. <laughs> At yet another security conference. This is the Kaspersky SAS, right? So now I have a profile, and I start traveling. I start with Copenhagen. I went to a security conference, uh, CISO Europe, to present there. And right as I get there, I see gorgeous woman. <clears throat> now, please ignore the young ages. This is all in the name of research, OK? <laughs> I'm doing this for you. I'm sacrificing myself for you here. And I, get, I start getting matches. And I'm like, oh, no, of course. I'm, you know, I'm Mediterranean. They must like that. Then. So I get a lot of uh, matches, and very quickly I get a message. <clears throat> now this is Copenhagen, the message is in Danish. Anyone from Denmark here? Really? None? Okay, so I translated it to you. Basically it says I broke up with my boyfriend, you want to have sex? And then there's a link. The link, by the way, says meet Dutch. But let's leave it at that. Uh, and it turns out that I'm really popular. I'm getting a lot of matches. How many matches? This much. Many, many matches. And they're all sending me the same message. And this is where I got suspicious. This is a, a, an Israeli comedy thing. And this started looking very, very suspicious. So I matched 57 different bots. OK, I'm already telling you the end of the story. These are bots. 57 identities. As you can see, all these profiles, they don't have the like or dislike buttons. These are all matches. And there are probably some more that I missed. And this is where the researcher instinct comes in. because. These are all screenshots. I realized that something was going on, so I started taking screenshots. <clears throat> and uh, in Tinder, you can tell where you're from and what you work at to give some information. And analyzing that, I mean, when you see all these patterns, you start seeing, first of all, you detect the patterns, and then it, it starts to not make sense, right? Uh, nine of them work at PR and communications. Nine of them work as flight attendants. OK, maybe they travel a lot. They don't have a boyfriend. I don't know. But uh, if you look at the place of education, with the exception of one that was in France, they are all indeed in Denmark. But if you look at the places of work, with the exception of one that was in the US, they're all actually in England. So I matched with 57 bots in Copenhagen, and they all work in England. And this is like, OK, something's going on here, right? Um, and most of them actually inside London. Uh, so it doesn't take long to understand that these are stolen identities. And it's rather easy to detect that. 
you start by seeing that there is a mismatch between what the profile says that the name and the age is and the free text. Tinder also allows, allows you to put some free text inside. And the free text gives you different information, different names, different ages. So you know it's not the same person, right? This was a mashup. Someone took one photos, uh, some of these photos from one place and some of these texts from another place and matched them up. And uh, sometimes you even have aliases like Instagram, right? So you can track that. So let's look at that. Kylie, 24, nursemaid, right? But her Instagram says Hele Thingord, which is a Scandinavian name. And if you go to Instagram and if you check that account, there is really a person by that name, but it is not the same person, right? If you go to Facebook, you find the same person that is the one in Instagram, but not the one on Tinder. So this is a fake identity, right? Another example, <coughs> Latrice, 27, but her Instagram and her Snapchat says her name is Olivia Meyer. And once again, you will find Olivia Meyer, and it is just not the same person, okay? So you know you're being lied to here. Next conference, this is all about conferences. I go to Denver, and in Denver, they are a little bit more direct in their approach. I get a match, and then I immediately get a message so they're, they're trying to be, uh, you know, cost effective here. Um, so if you look at the link, it leads to uh, some ad network. And if you follow that, you get to daily sex with a double X dot com. And that is not a dating site, just in case you had any doubt. And warning, you will see nude photos. Please be discreet. Just saying. So, OK, whatever. And that was the first time that I encountered chatty bots. Up until now, I was just getting that message, and that is automatic. But now, I'm starting to have real conversations, or at least it looks like that. So she said, hey, baby. And I'm like, quite the nocturnal type, are you? And I'm pretty sure she has no idea what nocturnal is. But still, we continue. And uh, I want to go get beers tomorrow. And I say, how about Tuesday? Do you want to go with me? And what if I do? And then, boom, look me up on Skype. Here's my alias on Skype. So this is fishy. Why is she moving me over to a different service? I call a friend. He says, don't bother. You're going to get spammed. I'm like, OK, I'm going to leave it at that. But then I get another one. <clears throat> this one ha is having a longer conversation. You can see the messages. I'm responding. And it's not really a Turing test, but I'm trying to come up with answers that are going to make her say something unusual. But she sticks to the script, naturally. Um, a long story, I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to say, once again, there was a link. Tinge aid, uh, Tinder age verifier, whatever. Hamburg, CCC, last year. Uh, I was presenting this at uh, uh, B-Sides, so I was collecting information before I got to Hamburg. And now they're getting cocky. Now they, they don't even bother getting a match. There's already a Google link in the profile, so you can just go there without matching the woman, right, in case you have low self-esteem. And that leads you to a site called Yeah Real Sex. And that site, turns out, is better than Tinder. <laughs> and why am I saying they're cocky? Because when you go there, they actually tell you, uh, you can unsubscribe. And they have a captcha. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> uh, yet another conference in Austin. And now, once again, we're going to switch uh, a chat platform. This gets funny. Uh, once again, another chat. By this time, I know for a fact that this is a bot. This is not a person. So uh, after a couple of messages, she says, you should message me there. And I'm just, yeah, the whole ABC, whatever. And of course, I get, find me on Skype. Here's my alias. But wait, does this look familiar? The alias for Skype is identical in format to the one that we've seen before, right? It's got a name, last letter repeats three times, and then there's a three-digit number. So this time I say, let's go with it. I create a, a new uh, Skype account, and I connect to her, and then she's happy. Hi, cutie, blah, blah, whatever. And I tell her I like talking to bots. I get to speak about it all over the world, because I know this is a bot now. And of course, I'm taking screenshots, because I'm already thinking on how I'm putting it in the presentation. And then it gets weird. She asks me if I like to choke. You do really want me to choke you? That's not going to end up well. And then I couldn't have planned it better. 
I say, I'm taking screenshots. This is going to look great on the Kaspersky SAS screens. <laughs> and then she says, I'm getting wet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, OK, we're going we're to stop here. So you see why I'm enjoying this? This is just so much fun. Uh, Vegas, I went to, uh, I gave this talk at uh, DEF CON, uh, one of the villages, Recon Village. And uh, once again, the usual inconsistencies, that you have a name and an age, and they don't match the, the free text that happens. And uh, we have a couple of funny examples. This one, Jesse, is actually Emmy. This is Emmy. And this girl, she says, I am not Julie from Tinder. So apparently a lot of people contact her, and uh, she gets bothered by that. So OK, let's track the infrastructure. This is getting interesting. We might want to know who does that. So if we go back to the first interaction, the one I had in Copenhagen, if you look at the, at the URL or the, the, the link, then it's very easy to track. If you use virus total, you don't even need to do anything sophisticated. Then you can get an IP address from that. And if you look at the IP address, you will see many similar names registered to the same IP address, right? So this is Meet Dutch. But look at the other uh, Swiss lovers, uh, Teen Buzz, Next Dates, Instasex. Obviously, these are all revolving around the same concept. <coughs> and of course, it's uh, behind a registration uh, uh, hiding tool. But out of 61 domains that were registered to that IP address, seven of them were different. And that was the big break that I was looking for. Uh, this one was using a different information, a different who is guard. Uh, this one was also using a different information. And then I got this one. The one in Denmark actually had registration information. Now, who is from Mar Marseille here? Any guys from Marseille, guys or gals? So this is fake information. And the way you know that is, first of all, the number is ridiculously not random. And also, the zip codes in Marseille all start with 1-3. And this is one, two. Uh, and also, if you look this address up, it actually does not exist. But you wouldn't expect, right? The only thing that is real here is the email address, because that's the one thing you can't fake if you want to register a domain. And it turns out that all the others are registered to the same uh, email, which I have no idea who stands behind it. These are uh, domains from Belgium. Now, how do we connect that? How do we know that it's all connected? Well. If you use a, uh, a site called Scam Advisor, then we will take two of the early batch, the ones in Copenhagen, uh, meetdutch.com and meetgirls.at. And you can see that they both redirect to dailysex.com. Dailysex.com was from a different conference. Okay? It was from a different place altogether. And you can see it's the same name. It's uh, the Eduard Zerkov, or however you read it. And that, that was the, the, the connecting link. This is from the different conference, but it connects to the two sites from the first one. And that is also uh, behind the domains by proxy. And I, when I try to look at the email address, I find another website. And this time, there's a different name, right? So I still don't know who this guy is. If any of you is interested to try to help me track this guy, feel free to help. Uh, this is the email. You can ask for it later. To this day, I don't know who this guy is. Uh, I've been. I've stopped getting uh, matches on Tinder with bots, so I think this guy knows who I am by now. And he's, because I, don't, I didn't invent a fake profile. I didn't see any purpose. So uh, this guy's please still running it. And then I said, OK, if it works on, on Tinder, it's going to work in other places as well. OK, Cupid, I got a, an anonymous message. A guy saying, I found a site. It's better. You go there. It's really bad. The English doesn't match. You can see it's really an amateur job. Uh, once again, you track it, a number of uh, names all more or less the same, going to the same IP address. I pick another one. I look this one up. And now I get a lead. It, the, there's actually a name and an address. And this is in the US. And it actually checks out. right? It, it's, it makes sense. It's a real address. But there's also an email. Now, if you look up the email on Facebook, of all places, you find a guy. The guy is called Devin Green. Now, here's the problem. This guy is called Devin Green, and this one is called Montreal Nubel. How do we connect them and know that they're the same person? Well, of course, public court records, because this guy is as straight as an arrow, right? 
Atlas Public Records, free public court records. This guy was arrested before. And he's Montrell Devon Nubel, right? So now we know it's the same person. Now, what do you never, ever do on Facebook if you're a criminal? You do not post photos of you holding <laughs> large amounts of cash. Okay? So just remember that. Okay? So the status of this research, it's been published. Evidently, the guy running the operation knows who I am, so I stopped getting those. But it was fun. <clears throat> this is something I only recently uh, finished. I actually talked about it once a couple of months ago. Uh, loyalty cards. This is a sensitive thing, so please, no photos. The video is not going to be released uh, right now, because even though I reported it, it is still there. So, Aroma. It's a nice coffee chain in Israel. They have uh, nationwide uh, about 242 branches all over the country, and they have a loyalty card. Uh, it's a card that you can uh, fill with money. It's a prepaid card. You fill it up in the store, and it gives you... Uh, 10% always discount, and it's anonymous. If you lose it, it's gone. They, they can't, you know, cancel it and issue you a new card. So it's nice. Now, why did I do the research? Well, first of all, I have this. This is a three-track reader and writer, and I was just looking for the opportunity to use it. Um, and uh, it's problematic because uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and also, very important, this lets you uh, check your balance online which is also a trigger, because if you can use a web query to get the balance on the card, this is interesting because it has the potential of uh, some vulnerability, maybe getting somebody else's data. And um, there was similar research performed by other people. Criminals have been doing that for a while. And I figured, OK, if the store that I go to is also vulnerable, I may as well find it and tell them. <coughs> so attack plan, very simple. Web interface, there are three things we can do. We can try web automation to see if we can uh, access the data of many people. We want to see if we can extract the data. And we want to see whether there is uh, authentication or not. What does it take to get information? And then you want to talk to, uh, to the magnetic stripe and see what's going on there. You want to analyze the card. No. See what you can do with that. So these are the two attack vectors. Once again, thanks to Yeroon, you start by creating an ethical hacking framework. You define exactly what you're going to do. You keep in mind uh, a few principles. One, privacy. This is other people's data, so you don't access it unless you have to. And if you can access it, then you either try to access it once instead of dumping the whole database, or if you're on the database, then you just access your record, and then you didn't touch anybody else's data. You want to take make sure that you don't touch other people's money because this is a billing card. So whatever I'm going to do during, during the research, it's all going to be my money. I'm not going to touch anybody else's money. It's very important. And we don't want to crash the servers because I've done that in the past. So you have to plan your automation as well. And it all has to be legitimate. And here's the catch. Israel has a credit card, or a, it's called the billing card statute from 1986. And it says very clearly that any modification to a billing card without the written consent of the issuer of the card is criminal. Okay, it's criminal. It's the, there's no argue here. So I can read all the cards I want, but if I change one bit, it's a crime. And because it's criminal, they don't even need to complain. If the police finds out, I'm in trouble, right? But lucky for me, this is the back of the card. And in this big sort of EULA that they have on the card, this says, this card is not a billing card as stated in the Israeli billing card statute of 1986. <laughs> now, the reason they did that is that because it makes it easier for them and they don't need to pay commission and they don't need to follow regulation. But for me, it's great. It means I can do whatever I want, OK? So website analysis. This is the balance check. You uh, need to put in your uh, card number. When you put in your card number, you get this. This is the balance. It says I have 42.5 shekels left. And you get up to 10 last uh, actions or activities you did in the card. And, uh, so it says when you did it, where you did it, and how much you paid, or how much you charge your card with. Now, this number that you put in comes from the card. This is the face of the card. You have the card number and four control digits, or maybe PIN code, call it whatever you want. But when you check the, uh, the balance of the card on the website, they don't ask for this. 
They should. They don't ask for that. And I said, aha. If they're not asking for that, what happens if I put a different number? Let's say the next one, because mine ends with 24. Let's put in 25. Boom. You get all the data. Really? I mean, this is just asking for it. So, of course, let's look at the traffic. It's a simple query, which you can duplicate with CURL. You don't need uh, a cookie at all. Now, this is part of the responsible disclosure or respons ethical hacking. Notice that I added an HTTP header in case they're looking at their logs. And it says uh, the name of the company, PX Research, opt out, contact, right? So even if they detect it, they don't like it, they know how to get to me. They know how to stop it. Not that I was breaking the law or doing something I'm not allowed to do, but I still give them the opt out um, option. And this is very important because it shows what you really meant to do. Now, <clears throat> in order to not strain the server, we decided that we're not going to enumerate more than 1,000 cards. Uh, we purchased five different cards, and we uh, loaded them all with money. There were, they were going to be the victim cards. That was the one that we're, th those are the ones we we're actually going to deal with, so we don't touch other people's money. So what we did is each card, we created a block of 250 cards around it. So we just enumerated on 250 cards at a time all together. Uh, 1,000 and then 20 more for the last stage. So this shows that we can do the enumeration without straining the server. And when we get the information, we only use information that is already ours. So once again, not crashing the server and no other people's money. <coughs> we got all the information. And now it's interesting to look at the balances. Uh, 100 shekels are about 24 euros or $28. OK, it's roughly 1 to 4, give or take. You can see that um, <clears throat> many of them were actually empty. This can be one of two. Either somebody used all their money, or maybe they haven't been activated yet. So they would have zero money on them. But the rest had various sums. And actually, two cards had over 400 shekels. That is roughly over 100 euros. <clears throat> and that's a lot of money. There's, that's a lot of coffee you can buy with that. Uh, you can also. Uh, uh, th these are the top balances. So one actually had 1,000 shekels. That's almost 250 euros. I don't know who loads their. Uh, you can only actually load 400 shekels at a time. So this guy had to come back and do it again. So <coughs> other possibilities that you can actually use the data if you want to be uh, a sophisticated attacker. You can look at the distribution of visited branches. Since my intention is to fake a card and use other people's money, then, then you can ask yourself, do I want to use a card that always visits the same branch? Because when they look at the report, they're going to see a billing that they don't know, but it's in the branch they always go to, so they, they, it must be them, right? Or do you want to pick a card that goes all over the country, and then they probably don't even remember if they went to that place or not? It's, it's an interesting consideration, right? Or uh, you can look at the amount of uh, money that they spend. If it's a card that spends big amounts, then they're probably not tracking it because money comes and goes. So you can steal their money, and it'll, go, it, it'll take longer before they notice it, right? So you can do all sorts of things. And then analyzing the card. This is the card, and this is the magnetic stripe. So track one and track three are empty, and track two has very little information. This is what we have there. So I'm going to give you the explanation. This, the, the semicolon is the prefix of the protocol, and so is the last one, the question mark. Then we have the card identifier. So this is normal. This is like every other credit card. In Israel, 4580 would be Visa, 5326 would be MasterCard, and so on. So 7766 is the number that they have. And then you have the card number. And then the last one is always zero. And this one, I don't know what it is. It keeps changing from card to card. So obviously, this is probably some sort of a parody or a CRC check. So now we start. The natural candidate for this, of course, is the Loon algorithm. This is what they use for regular credit card numbers, ID numbers, uh, maybe even social security. I'm not sure. And it's a nice algorithm. It's um, also called Modulo 10. But it's not that. I tried that, and it doesn't work. Uh, I even tried making stuff up. I just changed the number, and I went to the cashier, and it didn't work. So I knew that it really mattered. I couldn't just write there whatever I want. Uh, so of course, you say, OK, maybe it's a tense complement. Not Modulo 10, but tense complement. And that's not either. And I was spending like two hours on that. And then I said, OK, there's like one thing I didn't try. Is it 
just the sum of all digits? And yes, it is. So this is the, the parity or the secret or whatever. So now we know that this is the, tech, the checksum and it is actually the digit sum. So now it was time to give it a try. The scenario was we enumerated on all the cards. We picked the victim card, which is one of our four cards. And since when I enumerate, I only have the card number, what I need to do is to generate the magnetic stripe, right? But now I know how to do that. So I fabricated the magnetic stripe and I created the magnetic stripe of the victim card on another card. Now they're anonymous and they all look the same, so there's no way to know. The only way to know is when you pay with it and you get the receipt, it shows the number of the card. But no one actually compares them, not even with credit cards. No one does that, right? Uh, and even if they did, in some cashiers, it only shows the last four digits, so I can easily pick a card that has the same four digits and steal the money, right? So I go to the, uh, to the store. These are the two cards, 11391524 and 11393529. And I wrote the information of one on the other. And then I went to the cashier and drum roll. I bought coffee and cheesecake, and this you get the chocolate. And if you look closely, you will see that the customer number or the card number on the receipt is not identical to the one printed on the card. So this actually worked, okay? Now, disclosure. We wrote a nice disclosure document, and uh, I called the vendor, no answer, and then I was uh, acting like an Israeli. I looked them up, and they were like 900 meters from the office. So I just walked there with a brown envelope, you know, and I looked for the IT security guy. He wasn't there. I left the envelope at his desk, left him a nice note, went back to the office, and then he gave me a call back. And it was a nice call. We were talking for about 25 minutes. Uh, of course, it's, the, the call is recorded because this might get in, into a legal matter. Um, and this is also very important. It's also one of the principles of ethical hacking. Uh, we were talking about that, and he said, wow, this is so, th uh, so helpful. Uh, we, wa we want to compensate you. And I'm like, absolutely not. Okay, the law in Israel, and I, I presume that in other countries as well, says that if you so much as hint that in return for the vulnerability disclosure, you're expecting to get something in return, that is extortion, and that is a criminal offense. So he said, we want to give you something. And I'm like, absolutely not. I'm doing this to help you. We want absolutely nothing in return. Okay, it's very important because mostly young kids don't know that. And they're like, yeah, sure. Or uh, even the naive question, do you have a bug bounty program? That is very tricky. So I'm like, dude, this is your vulnerability. Here's the report. Now it's up to you. I will give you all the information. And he actually argues with me. It turns out that the four digits, he thought that they were in the cashier and that they were being used for authentication. And apparently, they used to have them on the, on the website, but they took them off. And I'm like, but you need to put them back. And he argues with me. And I'm like, you know what? Not my problem. I mean, this is a report. You do whatever you want. So this is still happening. They changed the interface a little bit, but this is still working. So a bunch of vulnerabilities. They're all relatively simple, but put together, I can steal the, the, the money of every single one of the cards that they have, right? So this is reported but ignored. <clears throat> Summing up, why did I choose these particular examples? Because like I said in the beginning, they're not overly sophisticated. We've seen some amazing talks here, super low level stuff. Uh, the, the girls that built the device to crash cars and the, the, the keyboard, the man in the middle, this is super sophisticated stuff. This is bullshit, really. You can do that you know, in your sleep. But why do I do this? For a number of reasons. Number one, I call it my dad test. The vulnerabilities that I found here are such that people like my dad, who are computer illiterate, they're just users. They don't really know more than the, the regular user. They can get hurt without doing anything wrong. And someone has to protect them. And it has to be us, the community, the security researchers that find vulnerabilities and report them. Yes, this is simple. But my dad, if he had an aroma card, he could lose his money. Or if he were at the, the airport, something could happen. So I do that, and it's simple, and it's easy, and you don't need any special tools. You can just do it anywhere you go. Number two, if you've ever spoken to C-level executives, and in my job at Checkpoint, I was talking to many of them, it turns out that they are very technology illiterate. If you try to explain to them something like, 
a little device connected to the CAN bus in the car, they don't understand you, and they deny the problem, and they're not going to deal with it. They're not going to allocate money. They don't understand it. My talks, if you've seen my last talk three years ago about physical insecurity, they see my talk, they get the sense that they could do that. And this is, this is a huge difference because now they understand. The threat is real. It's materialized in front of their eyes. They understand it, and now they take action. And the last thing, I try to teach a lot of young people. I'm one of the organizers of the Israeli DEF CON chapter, DC 9723, uh, uh, and we're trying to teach the people the state of mind of a hacker. Now, Angie were, was talking today. He mentioned uh, that people ask him how to get into security research. And the answer is curiosity. You always need to ask questions. And I started as a reverse engineer, so this is embedded in my thought process. Everywhere I go, doesn't matter if I work or not, everywhere I go, my mind just picks everything into little pieces and analyzes everything. And I ask the questions, why is it like this? How does it work? Is it always like this? Is the way I'm seeing it now, is it like all the other places that it, at, it's at or, or the other places that I've seen it before? Is there a pattern here? And then you just try stuff. And yes, you fail, also referring again to Angie's talk. This is how we learn. We try stuff. And I think many people that get depressed kind of forget that all the self-taught people actually fail all the time. That's how you learn. You try stuff. doesn't work. You try stuff. And then you succeed. And you're like, OK, now I know this. And then you move on. So you just try stuff, but do no harm. It's very important, because if you lose your legitimacy, then you're in trouble, and then the, the result of your research might be overlooked. So this is basically, I hope you enjoyed, and you should do that also. Look for stuff report it and make the world a better place. Thank you.